Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Two days out from their miraculous victory at Maracaibo, the fleet of Henry Morgan was hunted by a hurricane. They could see it coming, and they had no hope of escape. So the sailors struck their sails and dropped anchor, but the sea was too rough and too deep to hold them in place. It was easily possible to reach land before the storm struck, but they would be greeted there only by Spanish muskets and native spears. Their best hope was to stay at sea, face the storm, and hopefully ride it out. So they battened the hatches, secured the guns and their plunder, and they prayed. The storm hit, and their ships were rocked on violent waves. The buccaneers battled the storm harder than any Spaniard they'd ever faced. Men were thrown overboard, never to be seen again. Ships were separated or sunk, never to be seen again. The storm lasted for three days, with no man sleeping, eating, or resting. When it finally passed, the fleet was smaller, but still intact. The ships held less men than they had, but their treasure was secure. Morgan had wisely ordered the treasure they had taken at Maracaibo spread around to all of the ships in the fleet so that were one ship taken or lost, they would still have as much as possible. The brethren, after surviving the storm, set sail for home, wealthy men. Morgan thought fondly of his wife Elizabeth and of what his spoils would bring to them. It could bring them land, titles, a manor house, and peace. He would, finally, after so many years, start a family and never have to go out buccaneering again. This is episode 29, or any other place. One of the defining characteristics of this era, the Age of Sail, is just how slowly information traveled. Back in ancient Rome, news could take so long to travel from one part of the empire to another that the entire empire was often split into smaller states under their own emperors. By the 17th century, the world's empires could literally encompass the globe, and communication was that much more difficult. By the time Morgan returned to Jamaica, on May 16, 1669, Governor Sir Thomas Moody Ford had only just received word from Whitehall concerning Morgan's previous raid on Portobello, more than a year prior. And that news... Well, it wasn't good. Back in England, the Jamaica colony had a powerful benefactor. George Monk, the first Duke of Albemarle, was a powerful friend to have. He was instrumental in overseeing the restoration of King Charles and the monarchy of England. During the Great Fire and the Great Plague of 1666, he'd been in charge of what amounted to martial law in London and around parts of England. He was one of eight lords proprietor of the Carolina colony, and his second-in-command during the English Civil War had been none other than Henry Morgan's own uncle, and he was virtually in charge of military and foreign affairs there in England. His position on Spain was one of strength rather than appeasement. He saw Spain as the enemy, and Jamaica as a spear to use against her, to dislodge her. He argued that the only way for England to flourish was at the expense of Spain, and a strong Jamaica was integral to that stance. However, by 1669, when Morgan was returning from his most recent raid, Lord Albemarle was ill, and he had retired from public life. His influence at court, against Spain and pro-Jamaica, was gone. Jamaica was even more vulnerable than usual, and it's here that another actor enters the stage, one that had no such love for Jamaica. Henry Bennett was the first Earl of Arlington, and he was a man that believed in the absolute authority of the monarch. He wanted Parliament to be neutered, and he wanted to see the English throne molded after that of Louis XIV of France. He wanted to see King Charles as an absolute monarch. In his younger years, he'd spent time living in Spain, and he advocated at court for cozier relations with Spain. And then in 1667, while Lord Albemarle was busy dealing with the Second Anglo-Dutch War, Lord Bennett was named the Postmaster General and given control over foreign affairs for all of England. Oh, 
and he was secretly a Catholic. On one trip overseas, on which he had accompanied the king, the two men shared a mass given by a Catholic priest. That's right, the Merry Monarch, Charles II, King of England, head of the Anglican Church, whose grandfather had commissioned the King James Bible, was himself a secret Catholic. Now, both of these men, the King and Henry Bennett, played their part of good Protestants in public, and, in fact, Arlington more than once secured funds from overseas to support the English church, but that didn't stop these two men from negotiating a secret treaty with France that could see King Charles openly proclaim himself a Catholic and possibly, perhaps hopefully, return England to Catholicism. The secret Catholicism of the Stuarts and the religious tension that was building in England will eventually play a major role in our story of Caribbean piracy, but Arlington and Charles' religious inclinations directly impacted Henry Morgan, Governor Modiford, and Jamaica. In his quest for closer relations with Spain, Arlington saw Jamaica as something of a problem. They were a thorn in Spain's side, and every time the Brethren attacked a Spanish city, that thorn was driven in even deeper. The Spanish ambassador in England was threatening war. The Queen Regent herself was reportedly furious with King Charles, and all he had to offer her was the appointment of Arlington and promises to reign in the buccaneers of Port Royal and hopefully end their terror on the Spanish main. Back in Jamaica, while well, his men unloaded the cargo and prepared to enjoy their newfound wealth to the fullest, the governor relayed all this news to Admiral Morgan. Arlington's most recent letter had read, quote, His Majesty's pleasure is that in what state soever the privateers are at the receipt of this letter, you will keep them so till we have a final answer from Spain. With this condition he obliges them to forbear all hostilities on land. End quote. Now, neither Arlington nor Modiford knew it at this time, but this order was already too late. Things were now in motion that could not be averted. See, here's the rub. Modiford had never ordered Morgan to sack Maracaibo. The plan had originally been to take Spanish ships and possibly to engage or disable the Windward Fleet. It was to be a reconnaissance in force, in defense of Port Royal, but it had turned into a full-on assault of Spanish cities, a real invasion. That certainly constituted the hostilities on land that Arlington had commanded against. Now, what made this all worse was the certainty that Spanish ships were at this moment crossing the Atlantic, bearing news of the attack. The governor took action quickly. He shot off letters detailing the many depredations of the Spanish against Jamaica, most of them were fabricated, and the danger posed to the English settlers on Jamaica by the Windward Fleet. He wrote of the unruly nature of the buccaneers and his need for a proper navy. He wrote, too, of the trouble he would have with hundreds of unemployed, drunken murderers walking his streets. He wrote letter after letter to Arlington, to the Lords of Trade, and even to the King himself. They all argued for Jamaica's need of the buccaneers, and their weakness without them. Of all the many offenses recounted in his letters, even one of them recounted a, an invasion that never happened, None of them have any other record, and are generally thought to be false. Now, Lord Arlington agreed with this assessment, or at least he didn't care very much for the fate of Jamaica or her people. While the possibility of peace with Spain and seeing his king and country return to Catholicism was in the offering, there wasn't even a question in his mind. In his book The Pirate's Pact, Douglas R. Burgess Jr. discusses exactly why Modi Ford went to all this trouble. He writes, quote, It is worth pausing at this moment and questioning his motives. Greed was assuredly amongst them, but it seems hardly likely that he would risk not only his position, but even his life for simply another haul of Spanish gold. Was it patriotism, then? Did Modi Ford wish to bring war back between England and Spain for reasons of his own? Again, it is unlikely. This was an age before nationalism, when war was a detached, diplomatic exercise. Modi Ford may not have liked the Spanish, but neither did he hate them. The most plausible explanation is that Modi Ford had lived so long as governor in Jamaica, so far 
removed from his peers and his supervisors that he now believed himself to be outside the English political system. The fragile bonds of patronage that had brought him to power had been severed somewhere in the Atlantic between the two isles, England and Jamaica, and he was now no one's man but his own. End quote. I chose to read this quote because I think it's important to look at Governor Modi Ford's motives, but I disagree with basically everything in that passage. It could absolutely have been greed on the governor's part. And it could have been, well, well, not patriotism, no, but, but a rekindled war with Spain would likely see Jamaica suddenly an important outpost to be properly funded and supplied, rather than a vulnerable, inconsequential island out at the edge of the world. And the author's conclusion that Modi Ford was no longer beholden to England, I mean, why try so hard to impress the desperation of your circumstances upon them? Jamaica was actually under threat. Spain wanted her back, no matter what the foreign queen regent said about it. The governors in the region were bent on it. It seems to me that Modi Ford was just doing his job. He'd been charged with the governance and protection of Jamaica, and his family's fates were now tied to the island, and he was getting no support from back in England, so he had to manufacture that support to do what he could with what he had. Still, his protests went unheeded. Lord Arlington wrote back to him, quote, This way of warring is neither honorable or profitable to his majesty. He has endeavored to put an end to it. End quote. A month after the fleet returned to Port Royal, on June 24, 1669, Modiford, Morgan, and the town council marched into the square as the town crier proclaimed, quote, from now on we prohibit any acts of hostility against the vassals of his Catholic majesty by whatsoever person or persons. End quote. Arlington had made it abundantly clear. There would be no more letters of mark. Any Englishman that traveled to Tortuga to acquire one would be treated as a pirate. Any Englishman convicted of piracy would be hung. It appeared that the buccaneering days of Port Royal were at an end. For Morgan, and for several of his top captains, that was just how they wanted it. This would be a peace with Spain and an attempt to stop their lives of buccaneering. Morgan bought 800 acres of land suitable for planting sugar. He bought slaves and equipment, and he settled down to spend time with his wife and hopefully start a family. His top captains, men that were all English soldiers rather than regular brethren, also bought land from their hall. One of them bought as much as 1,000 acres. These men took wives if they could find them and began their lives properly at last. These men were at least attempting to join the gentleman class, becoming proper plantation owners and leaving their violent lives behind. For Henry Morgan himself, life was good. His cousins and his in-laws were doing well and having children. They were all on the governing council there in Jamaica. His family all told, owned more land than any other in Jamaica, and they were second in influence only to Modifords. For almost a year, things were peaceful for the Morgans. Despite Elizabeth not getting pregnant, Henry was at the head of a great clan that was building a legacy on Jamaica. Now, the governor was not without headaches, but nothing so serious. The day after he made the announcement in the town square, he sent off a letter to the Spanish ambassador. Stephen Talty writes of it in Empire of Blue Water, quote, On June 25th, 1669, he sent the Conde de Molina, the Spanish ambassador to England, a letter. The fact that he was the governor of an upstart colony, completely illegal in Spanish eyes, addressing the representative of a world-straddling empire, did not seem to cross his mind in writing this amazing document. Quote, I know, and perhaps you are not altogether ignorant of your weakness in these parts, he wrote. The thinness of your inhabitants, want of hearts, arms, and knowledge in war, the open opposition of some, and doubtful obedience, or of other, of the Indians. And back to Talty. Moodyford warned the ambassador that, in the event of a permanent peace between England and Spain, the French corsairs would simply take up where Morgan had left off unless the Spanish agreed to his proposal. Namely, that they hire the brethren as a mercenary army to protect the main. Quote, what we could have done, 
the French will do, unless these men may by your intercession be brought to serve your master. End quote. As you might imagine, the government of Spain didn't take this mocking and insulting proposition too seriously, but they did have to find something to do with all of these men who had been buccaneers. Now, some of them rented plots of land from their captains. It was a reasonable offer. They knew their landlords well and knew they weren't cruel men or usurers. They paid for the use of that land, but they cultivated it in place of slaves and possibly could earn enough to buy their own piece of land one day. Now, many of the buccaneers joined the militia there in Jamaica, especially the younger men among them. But even more brethren sailed off to cut logwood on the main. Logwood is that particular type of wood that is used for making dyes back in England. Now this wasn't as lucrative a trade as privateering, but it was an acceptable life. These men could drink and sing and roast boar around the fire, and since the wood that they were cutting was a valuable commodity on Spanish land, they still got to stick it to the Catholics. Now, there's probably a distinction here that isn't talked about too much in the primary sources, and it's hard to verify, but a lot of historians do mention it. Some of the earliest buccaneers, those out of Tortuga and Hispaniola, were probably gay. Their lifestyle was one without women, and often it was one that excluded women by design, like no girls allowed. Now, some of these men were ostracized from their homes for religious reasons, but most that wasn't the case. They just seemed to drift away from Europe to the farthest flung reaches of the colonies for reasons unknown, or at least unrecorded. Perhaps those reasons were too shameful to record. And actually, that theory makes sense in a number of ways. While some gay men might join the church, where the obligation to marry and have children was lifted, others might seek a place far away from civilization, where they could hunt and camp and live free, far away from society's expectations and judgments. Now, that's a controversial opinion, but it has some merit, and it seems likely that, if true, those brethren that chose to sail away from a life with women and children to live much as the buccaneers of decades prior had, might have been gay too. Now, it's worth noting that it seems to have been less common among the English buccaneers than the French or the Dutch, probably because the English had mostly either come over with the invasion or been sent over to Jamaica on a penal ship, while the French and Dutch had mostly immigrated on their own. Regardless, aside from a few privateers that decided to turn full pirate and wound up swinging for it, those months were mostly peaceful and pleasant times for the Brethren of the Coast. Remember, though, how I said that this era could be so interesting due to the challenge of communication in such large, vast empires? Well, you see, the order to cease and desist all hostilities came down due to Morgan's raid on Portobello. But word of the raid on Maracaibo had finally made its way to Lisbon and London, and none were happy about it. To Spain, it was just further proof that England had no intention of stopping these raids. To England, it was proof that Jamaica was out of control and that the treaty with Spain was in jeopardy. The diplomatic channels were growing tense and even dangerous, and it was becoming clear that war was looming on the horizon, which England desperately wanted to avoid at all costs. So they placed all of the blame on the buccaneers, which, really, it was their fault, let's be real here. Now, Spain accepted this, but decided to take the old phrase, no peace beyond the line, very seriously. While the men in Jamaica peacefully planted, Spain prepared for war. In January 1670, Governor Modi Ford decided Port Royal had finally settled down and elected to send a vessel to St. Iago de Cuba, carrying several freed Spanish prisoners, a letter from Modi Ford to the Spanish governor, and a hold full of goods that the Spanish needed and wanted. If there was to be peace, he thought, let there be trade. The ship was named Mary and Jane, under Captain Bernard Clayson Spierdijk, a former buccaneer known as Captain Bernard or Captain Bart. He was received in the Spanish port very cautiously. His entire ship was searched four times, but when the Spanish were finally satisfied and he released the prisoners, he sent the letter on up to the governor and opened his holds for trade. 
Eventually, though there was some hard bargaining, everything sold, and Captain Bernard sailed away from St. Iago, a happy and somewhat wealthier man. Hopefully, this would be the first of many such missions. Then, on February 27th, the captain spotted a ship flying English colors. He sent a boat over to inquire, and those men were welcomed aboard. Then, the strange ship sailed toward the Mary and Jane. Now, that wasn't normal. The other vessel called out across the water, Where are you bound from? Captain Bernard replied, Jamaica. And then the strange ship called out, Defend yourself, dog, I come as punishment for heretics. She opened fire, a full broadside. The strange ship carried a total of fourteen guns and the Mary and Jane only six. But Captain Bernard held his ground, and for hours the two ships traded volleys. There was no decisive victor that evening, but when morning came, the battle began again, this time in true earnest. Each ship poured every ounce into the fight for the next several hours. Captain Bernard was killed, and eventually the forecastle of the Mary and Jane caught fire. She was forced to surrender. The buccaneers were captured and ferried over to the larger vessel, and it was instantly clear that the Spanish had suffered at least five times as many losses, if not more, but they had more men and more guns. This was a ship intent and armed for war. Nine men from the Mary and Jane, English and Dutch men, were put in a canoe and told to sail for Port Royal, to tell the governor of what had happened and to deliver a message from the captain of that Spanish vessel. The ship was the San Pedro y la Fama, and her master was Manuel Rivero Pardal. He was very clear that his name was repeated to Governor Modiford and especially to Admiral Morgan. When he returned to Cuba, Rivero was greeted as a hero. This was the first great victory over Morgan. He even recited a poem to mark the occasion. It read, quote, I am the defender against this monster. I have been confirmed captain of these coasts. By St. Peter, I was the first. My name alone is enough to make the sea and all these barbarians tremble. End quote. Now Morgan and Modiford were certain that this was the beginning of something far worse, and the men who had met Rivero agreed with that assessment, but back in London, Lord Arlington brushed it away as nothing more than an isolated incident. Then, a few days later, word came from a pair of English ships returning from a logwood-cutting expedition on the Yucatan. They'd been attacked by a much larger ship in the Bay of Campeche, and they were assumed lost. But then, a few days after that, a large Spanish vessel, San Nicolas de Tolentino, sailed into port, flying English colors. Those two buccaneer vessels, or those two logwood-cutting vessels, had been attacked, but they, being such talented and experienced soldiers, had overwhelmed the larger ship, and they had made her their own. And now, the governor and Morgan had the proof they needed. In the captain's quarters of that larger vessel, they'd found a letter from the governor of Cuba stating that the governor had been given authority, along with all other Spanish governors, to issue letters of reprisal lasting five years to any and all willing Spanish captains in response to the raids on Portobello and Maracaibo. The Queen Regent had declared war on the English in Jamaica and on the Brethren of the Coast. She intended to, quote, execute all hostilities which are permitted in war by taking possession of all the ships, islands, places, and ports, end quote. This letter was hard proof that Spain was making war on Jamaica, but still Arlington and King Charles would not hear of it. Their plans with Spain were too important to risk on a small island like Jamaica. It was clear to the parties involved that they had been abandoned by England. And on July 11th, it became clear just what threats they faced. On the north coast of Jamaica, far from Port Royal, two ships were spotted making for land. By the time that reports reached Spanish town and the governor, a force of Spanish troops had already landed. The area that the Spanish landed on was lightly inhabited. 
but there was a small militia force and a village of loggers and planters there. The militia was soundly defeated. Then the Spanish turned their attention on the locals. Now, what in the past, Diego Lucifer, Roque Brasiliano, Henry Morgan, and especially Francois Lolonnais had done all along the Spanish main was truly terrible. Theft, torture, rape, and murder all along the coasts of the West Indies. I don't want to excuse that at all. But the tenor of what the Spanish did here was different. This was not a raid. There was no plundering, no hostages taken or ransoms demanded. There was no search for gold or jewels. This was revenge, and it was executed with military efficiency. Every man and boy was cut down. Women and girls were violated before being killed themselves. Every building they came across burned. This was a message. What you have done to us, we can do back, only worse and without remorse. Fear our might. There was also a real physical message left as well, from that same captain that had attacked the Mary and Jane. It read, quote, I, Captain Manuel Rivero Pardal, to ye chief of ye squadron of privateers in Jamaica, I am he who this year have done that which follows. I went on shore at Caimonos and burnt twenty houses and fought with Captain Arai and took him from a catch laden with provisions and a canoe. I am he who took Captain Baines, that is, Captain Bernard, and did carry the prize to Cartagena, and am now arrived at this coast and have burnt it. I am come to seek Admiral Morgan with two ships of war of twenty guns, and, having seen this, I crave he would come out upon the coast and seek me, that he might see the valor of the Spaniards. And because I had no time, I did not come to the mouth of Port Royal to speak by word of mouth in the name of my king, whom God preserve. Dated 5th of July, 1670. End quote. It was now clear to everyone on Jamaica that the island, small and surrounded by enemies, was now at war with the largest and richest empire in the world, and they would get no help from home. Modiford knew this, so he was forced to turn once again to his friend and collaborator, Henry Morgan. He wrote out a letter of Mark, without official permission, and presented it to Henry Morgan. I'm going to read it here in full. Quote, Sir Thomas Modiford, baronet, governor of His Majesty's Island of Jamaica, commander-in-chief of all His Majesty's forces within the said island and the islands adjacent, vice-admiral to His Royal Highness the Duke of York in the American Seas, to Admiral Henry Morgan, Esquire. Greeting. Whereas the Mariana, Queen Regent of Spain, hath by her royal shadula dated at Madrid the 20th of April, 1669, commanded her respective governors in the Indies to publish and make war against our sovereign lord the king in these parts. And whereas Don Pedro Bayona de Villanueva, Captain General of the Province of Paraguay and the Governor of the City of Santiago de Cuba and its provinces, hath executed the same, and lately, in the most hostile and barbarous manner, landed his men on the north side of the island, and entered a small way into the country, firing all the houses they came at, killing or taking prisoners all the inhabitants they could meet with, and where, as the rest of the governors in these parts have granted commissions for executing the like hostility against us, and are diligently gathering forces together to be sent to Santiago de Cuba, their general rendezvous and place of magazine, and from thence as the most opportune place to be transported for a thorough invasion and final conquest, as they hope, of the island. In discharge of the great trust which his gracious majesty hath placed in me, I do by virtue of full power and authority of such cases from his royal highness, James, Duke of York, his majesty's lord high admiral, derived unto me, and out of the great confidence I have in the good conduct, courage, and fidelity of you, the said Henry Morgan, to be admiral and commander-in-chief of all the ships, barks, and other vessels now fitted, or which hereafter shall be fitted for the public service and defense of this island, and also of the officers, soldiers, and seamen, which are, or shall be put upon the same, requiring you to use your best endeavors to get the vessels into one body or fleet, and to cause them to be well manned, fitted, armed, and victualled, and, by the first opportunity, wind and weather permitting, to put to sea for the guard and defense of this island. 
and all of the vessels trading to or about the same, and, in order thereunto, to use your best endeavors to surprise, take, sink, disperse, and destroy all the enemy's ships or vessels which shall come within your view. And also, for preventing the intended invasion against this place, you are hereby further authorized and required, in the case that you and your officers in your judgment find it possible or feasible, to land and attain the town of Santiago de Cuba, or any other place belonging to the enemies, where you shall be informed that magazines and stores for this war are laid up, or where any rendezvous for their forces to embody are appointed and there to use your best endeavors for the seizing of the said stores and to take, kill, and disperse the said forces. And all officers, soldiers, and seamen who are or shall be belonging to or embarked upon the said vessels are hereby strictly enjoined both by sea and land to obey you as their admiral and commander-in-chief in all things as becometh there, and you yourself are to observe and follow all such orders as you shall have from time to time received from his most excellent majesty, his royal highness, or myself. End quote. So Morgan was to raise a fleet, as large as possible, with as many men as could be mustered. He was to take or sink any Spanish vessels he came across. He was then to seize any Spanish stores or magazines he could find, and then take, kill, or disperse the Spanish forces. He was to do this at Santiago de Cuba, or any other place belonging to the enemies. This was, yes, a letter of mark for Captain Morgan. Ostensibly, it gave him the legal authority to attack the Spanish. But it was more than that. This didn't allow him to attack Spanish forces. This commanded him to gather everyone he could and attack all the Spanish forces he could find. This was a declaration of war. But not a declaration between nation-states. This was a declaration of war from one small colony, armed only by a group of rough, violent, drunken pirates against the greatest empire the world had yet known. The people of Port Royal were terrified and had decided to entrust their fate to Captain Morgan and the Brethren of the Coast. That very day, the day that he received his letter of mark, ships were sent out across the New World. They went out in every direction, to go to the Bay of Campeche and the Yucatan, to go down south to Providence Island and even the Spanish Main. They went to Tortuga, they went to Cuba, they went as far as Nassau and the Leeward Islands. Ships went everywhere, to gather as many men as could be found. Back in Port Royal, the holy men, on street corners, preached that the end was nigh and a final climactic judgment was coming. All the while... The ground beneath Port Royal rumbled ominously and began to shake. Next time, we'll look at, well, the next chapter in this story is the greatest piratical raid of all time. So great, in fact, that it leaves behind the name of Pirate Raid and becomes really a military venture. We're going to look at the steps leading to and the fallout from Henry Morgan's raid on Panama. <laughs>